This is slide six in our 1920s unit, foreign ideas. Um, and the first thing you understand uh, to, for the rest of this slide to make sense is that the 1920s was an incredibly high time of anti-immigrant feelings. Um, after World War I, the United States was interested in one thing and one thing only, and that was getting our country back up and going again and minding our own business. Um, we knew socialism um, in Europe had caused a lot of problems, um, and we had no interest in it coming over here. So this is a very uh, anti-immigrant time. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind here as we, as we go through uh, this slide. Okay? Um, the Bolsheviks, if you think back to World War I, they're the, the group who overthrows the Russian government, um, there is a group or a bit of Bolshevik influence in this country. Um, a, uh, a communist party in America had uh, started up. Uh, anytime there were labor problems, strikes or whatever, uh, socialists and communists get blamed for those. Right? Um, that leads to this fear of you know, socialist infiltration into the country leads to what's known as the Red Scare. Right? Um, the Reds are the communists, right? The communist flag is red. Um, and uh, there was a great fear that communists were going to take over America, uh, if not by military, then from within. Um, there was a, um, a, a nationwide crusade against socialism and communism. Um, now, there you see the uh, political cartoon here, the, the Russian guy there with his, uh, it's, it's hard to read, but on his knife it says Bolshevism and the flame of anarchy overthrowing the government. The Reds, it says on his hat, uh, sneaking in under the American flag. Now, this, a lot of this fear, this Red Scare, is led by the Attorney General, a man named Mitchell Palmer. Attorney General Mitchell Palmer. And Palmer rounded up 6,000 or so, roughly right around 6,000 people that he suspected of being communist supporters, socialist supporters. Right? Um, most of them were members of the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, the I Won't Works, the Wobblies, whatever you want to call them. Most of them were labor union members of the IWW, uh, but 6,000 of them. Um, about over 550 were deported, kicked out of the United States. Um, all 6,000 are immigrants, right? uh, and over 550 are deported. Judges threw out most of the rest of the cases for lack of evidence. Um, but in return for Palmer's actions here, um, his house and Wall Street, uh, the symbol of American capitalism, right? Uh, Palmer's home and Wall Street were bombed by anarchists, people who don't believe in any kind of government whatsoever. Uh, 38 people were killed, over 400 wounded, um, in the bombings, okay? uh, which are a di direct result of the Palmer raids. Okay? Now, we also need to uh, talk about the story here of two very famous immigrants uh, named Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti. You don't need to worry about their first names. Uh, they're Italian, okay? um, almost always known together, Sacco and Vanzetti. They were um, Italian immigrants, and here you see their uh, uh, picture up in the top right corner of the slide there. Sacco and Vanzetti were um, arrested and convicted of the murder of a Massachusetts paymaster. You know, the guy who goes to the bank and gets all the money and brings it back to the, the factory to pay all the workers. Well, this guy gets robbed and killed. Sacco and Vanzetti are um, uh, arrested, put on trial, and found guilty of murdering this paymaster, even though there were 
numerous witnesses that could place them somewhere else at the time the, uh, the, the murder occurred. Um, they were simply guilty of being immigrants in the United States at a period of very high anti-immigrant feelings. Okay? Um, they were found guilty and were uh, executed. They were electrocuted in uh, 1927. They become martyrs uh, for the communists and the radicals in the country. So probably more harm was done by killing them than the government hoped uh, to avoid by getting rid of them. So uh, Sacco and Vanzetti, two probably fairly good chance innocent men put to death for a crime they did not commit. Uh, they'd done nothing more wrong than being immigrants in the U.S. at a time when we didn't like immigrants. Now, leading the charge against them here, immigrants in general, not just Sacco and Vanzetti, um, is the KKK. The Klan will make a return here in the 1920s. Uh, we haven't talked about them since uh, Reconstruction in the West, but uh, the Klan is back and bigger than ever. Okay? Uh, and the reason they are bigger than ever uh, is because they become what I like to call equal opportunity bullies. Um, they are no longer just sort of anti-black. Uh, the last time we saw them after the Civil War, they targeted blacks. Now, they're certainly still going to do that, but they're going to branch out um, and also target other groups. Now, I found a, a, a description here of them, uh, and so I don't uh, leave anything out. Let me just read it to you. Uh, the 1920s Klan was anti-foreign, anti-Catholic, anti-black, anti-Jewish, anti-pacifist, anti-communist, anti-internationalist, anti-evolutionist, anti-bootlegger, anti-gambling, anti-adultery, and anti-birth control. Now, you may be wondering if they're anti-all those things and against all those things, what can they possibly be for? Well, that is our next little bullet here. Uh, they support, they are for, wasps. Now, that's not the little flying around sting you insect thing. Notice these are all capitals. It's an acronym. Okay? It stands for White Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Uh, and that basically sums up who a Klansman is. The Klan has a problem with you if you are not white, not Anglo-Saxon, and not Protestant. Now, to understand why, you've got to understand the, the, the mind of a typical Klansman here. Okay? In the mind of a typical Klansman, his job is to rid America of everything that's not purely American in his mind. Now, I, in my opinion, his mind is very warped and twisted. So, um, I, <laughs> I'm not saying certainly I believe any of this. I'm just trying to explain to you why they have a problem with most everybody. Um, think of this. Think of it this way. Okay? Um, in the mind of a typical Klansman, a pure, true American has to be white. Why? Because who were the first settlers of this country? They were pilgrims, right? Uh, the pilgrims came here, they settled, they founded um, uh, colonies, the Mayflower comes over, they bring pilgrims, and all that, right? They're white. So if you're not white, you can't be a true, pure American. Okay? Anglo-Saxon, that's the A-S in WASP, Anglo-Saxon, meaning that you can trace your heritage to Northern European races. The Angles, and, meaning, and the Saxons, Northern European, uh, Scandinavian, Germanic, English, obviously. Um, if you can trace your heritage to those races, then obviously you are a true American because those were the settlers of America. The Klan chooses to ignore Native Americans, just the fact that they were here. So, again, twisted and warped. Um, all right. Protestant, P, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Um, in the mind of a Klansman, if you are not a Protestant, you're not a true American. Um, in particular, they have problems with Jews and Catholics because where is the Jewish faith centered? Where is it headquartered, if you will? Jerusalem, 
the Middle East. If you're from there, if you're Jewish, you obviously worship a faith that is not American. Where is the Catholic faith based? Rome, Southern Europe. So if you're Catholic, you're obviously not true American. They consider themselves and Protestant faiths like uh, Baptist, Episcopalians, Methodists, Church of Christ, things like that. Uh, they consider Protestants true Americans. So unless you are a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, the Klan has a problem with you. And in the 1920s, they have problems with uh, blacks, immigrants, Jews, Catholics. Blacks, immigrants, Jews, and Catholics. Now, the Klan is particularly popular and powerful um, in what's known as the Bible Belt of the United States. Um, if you look at sort of the middle, um, from the middle of the country down, um, the south, basically, uh, into the Midwest. Uh, and typically, the Bible Belt is dominated by Protestant faiths. So, hence the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Um, the Klan is popular there for religious reasons. Um, Protestants typically believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible. Um, it's fundamentalism. Okay? Um, and a literal interpretation means that if the Bible says it, you literally believe it is true. Okay? Um, so that if the Bible says uh, Noah built a big boat and sailed around on it while the world was flooded, then that's what happened. Noah big, built a big boat. Uh, if the Bible says that God took a rib from man and made Eve, then that's how women, woman was made. If the Bible says that Jonah was swallowed by a big fish and then later spit up onto dry land, then that's literally what happened. Okay? Um, it is a literal interpretation of the Bible. Now, the other way to kind of look at that is a um, is a, sort of that the Bible is symbolic. It's full of stories that weren't really true, but they're meant to point out truths to us. Okay? Now, I'm not saying one's right and one's wrong. You're free to believe whichever you want. But the Bible belt is typically um, full of fundamentalism, literal interpretation of the Bible. Um, and most Klansmen buy into that. Now, that's going to be very important in our next slide, so you need to understand that. If you don't, please ask a question about it in class, okay? Um, at its height in the 1920s, the mid-1920s, the Klan was popular all over the country. Uh, they had up to 5 million members, uh, and there you see the, uh, the picture of them marching in front of uh, the U.S. Capitol building. Okay. Uh, so up to five million members. Here the uh, political cartoon, okay? uh, the clan shark there, waiting to devour the, the Catholic, because he says Rome over his head there, ready to dive into the USC, and the clan shark waiting to eat him up. Uh, looked meant to look like a shark, but also the white hood of a clansman. Notice the little bishop hanging from the, uh, the hood there. Okay. Um, Eventually, the Klan will uh, decline in strength in uh, the late 1920s, early into the 30s, um, when uh, some, of their, some of the high-ranking officials uh, were prosecuted for embezzling funds, uh, profiting from membership, and all of that. Um, but this is the height uh, of Klan influence, um, and clan importance in U.S. history, the 1920s. Now, immigration during this decade, uh, we said it's a very anti-immigrant time. Uh, immigration is going to drop. Uh, in fact, by 1931, end of the decade here, by 1931, more people were leaving the United States than were coming to it. It's the only time in U.S. history that's ever happened before. Uh, we had more people leaving than coming. Um, and that's due to the very high anti-immigrant feelings during the, the 20s. Now, how, is, how does that happen? There's a new law passed, uh, the Immigration Act of 1924. 
Okay, this law is going to say, um, well, it's going to do one thing. It's going to lower immigration to the U.S., but it's going to do it in two ways, two parts to this act. The first thing it's going to say is, um, we're going to look at how many people live in this country from another country. So let's say from Germany. We'll just pick Germany. Um, it's going to look at how many people lived in this country that had come here from Germany, and we're going to lower the amount that can come. So we're going to say, okay, um, in 1923, 3% we're allowed to come from Germany. So let's say we have, you know, 100 people living in the U.S. from Germany. There's lots more than that. But in 19, as of 1923, there were 100 living here. In 1923, 3% could come in. So 3. They're going to lower that to 2%. So we go from 3% to 2%, okay, um, of the total population of that country here in the U.S., is allowed to come in. So we're going to lo greatly lower the amount that can come in. But the second part is the most important. Okay, We're going to change the baseline. Okay, When it was 3%, what we used was the 19... excuse me, 1910 census. And in 1910, we had a lot of people coming here, living here from Southern Europe and Eastern Europe. High socialist areas, countries we don't like. Okay? But we don't want those people coming here. So what we're going to do is change the baseline. We're not going to use the 1910 census anymore when we have a lot of people already here from Southern and Eastern Europe. Instead, we're going to use the 1890 census. We're going to go back 20 years. When we didn't have many people living here from Southern and Eastern Europe, so we're going to use a baseline that has a lower starting number and we're going to lower the number that can come in based on that line. So we, we slow down immigration to basically a trickle here uh, thanks to the Immigration Act of 1924. It changes the baseline years and it lowers the percentage that are allowed to come in based on those years. Okay. What you end up with is immigration from countries that we like. We like Northern Europe. We like um, England. We like Scandinavia. Okay? We like Ireland. They're okay. We like Canada. We like Latin America. Okay? What we don't like is Southern and Eastern Europe, where socialism abounds. We don't particularly like Asia, so we'll cut that off too. Okay? Now, what you end up with, because of this attitude of anti-immigrant feelings are ethnic islands. Okay? You get ethnic communities cut off from everybody else. So we tell the Chinese, you all go live over there together and don't bother anybody else. We tell the Italians, you go live over there together and don't bother anybody else. We tell the Germans, you go live over there together and don't bother anybody else. That's why you end up with places like Little Italy and Chinatown and Germantown in cities all across America. Because we tell those people, you keep to yourselves and don't bother anybody else. Don't stick your nose where it doesn't belong. Ethnic islands, little islands of cultural communities cut off from everybody else.